Watch on, my friends, to hear the woeful tale of a peasant of the Austrian countryside, who tried his best, yet always seemed to fail, from the flails of critics, barbs, and worse besides. Of a hopelessly romantic man of God who loved, in equal parts, teen girls and death. And though today we judge him to be odd, his music bears a weight with every breath. These works of his are long and hard to grasp, yet underneath it all is a formal plan. Wagnerian? Perhaps, but not so fast. The symphony was where he made his stand. I'm the classical nerd, and today we shall speak of what made Anton Bruckner so unique. Josef Anton Bruckner was born in the northern Austrian town of Ansfelden in September 1824 and would become the eldest of 11 children. His father and grandfather had been school teachers, and from an early age it seemed as though the young Anton might follow in this patrilineal legacy as he helped the younger children in their studies. He took up the organ in these early years and was a dedicated student of the instrument because music was a part of the curriculum. In 1833, Bruckner was sent off to school in Hersching, about seven miles away, to study organ with Johann Baptist Weiss, under whose tutelage he produced his first composition. When the elder Bruckner died in 1837, the 13-year-old Anton was shipped off about five miles down the road to a monastery in Sankt Florian, where he was a choir boy for several years. And despite his abilities singing, playing the organ, playing the violin, and his budding interest in composition, his mother decided that it'd be best for him to continue the family tradition and become a school teacher, which involved taking a seminar, after which he was shipped off to the town of Windhag by Freistadt on the modern-day Austria-Czech Republic border. He made about $14 a month in today's money and was constantly belittled by his superiors. His position involved heavy grunt work like shoveling manure around. His next position was in Kronsdorf, closer to his hometown, and that was close enough to the town of Inns that he could study with the organist-composer Leopold von Zinetti beginning in 1843. Bruckner primarily studied the art of realizing figured bass with von Zinetti, and the two would remain close even after formal lessons concluded. From 1845 onwards, Bruckner stayed in Sankt Florian, where he worked as a teacher and as the organist. He was remarkably dedicated on the instrument, sometimes putting up to 13 hours of practice in per day, but he also wanted to branch out, and at this point he had to his name several choral works. Bruckner had written a Missa Solemnis in 1854, and on the advice of the itinerant Czech composer Robert Führer, showed the score to the Austrian composer and theorist Simon Sechter, who was known for two things. One, the sheer number of pieces he wrote, and two, the fact that he kept all of his students from writing original compositions while they studied with him. Sechter liked what he saw and agreed to take on Bruckner as a student in counterpoint and theory. While Sechter taught these subjects at the Vienna Conservatory, Bruckner couldn't get there with any regularity, so most of his lessons with Sechter were by correspondence. In the early 1860s, Bruckner discovered the music of Richard Wagner through his orchestration tutor, Otto Kitzler. Under Kitzler, Bruckner began composing for orchestra. Many of these pieces were study pieces that weren't premiered until after his death. Of particular note here is the Symphony in F minor, known as the Study Symphony, which was labeled as Symphony No. 1 when he wrote it, but was later revised. As we'll see, revision is a huge part and problem of Bruckner musicology. He was nearly 40 years old when he finally felt like he'd had enough study, which is coincidentally around the same time that he put the finishing touches on his first big mass. He'd entered the musical world fairly late in life, but actual success in that world continued to elude him for some time. The story of exactly how he entered the broader musical world is rather amusing because one of the rites of passage was to submit to a jury of five esteemed Viennese musicians. They gave him a theme upon which he was to improvise a fugue, standard organ mastery fare if you can believe it. Although unbeknownst to the other four members of the jury, one of them decided to double the length of the subject which makes improvising a fugue infinitely more difficult. Bruckner got it, 
and didn't just improvise the best fugue that any of them had ever heard, but he also preceded it with a massive theme and variations, which slowly built up to the theme upon which he improvised the fugue. Bruckner soon succeeded his old teacher Sechter at the Vienna Conservatory, and then redoubled his efforts towards symphonic composition. While he's best known for his symphonies today, he also wrote many choral works. His problem was that he didn't have very many orchestral pieces to his credit, and he also wasn't keen on diluting his sensibilities just to please the Viennese. The provincial Bruckner had stepped into the middle of a wider cultural conflict between supporters of Brahms on one side and supporters of Wagner on the other, and by throwing his hat into the ring on the Wagnerian side, he made immediate enemies of the pro-Brahms critics. As a result, Bruckner's symphonies largely fell on the ears of hostile audiences who found them nigh unlistenable, and leading the charge in the press was the anti-Wagner critic Eduard Hanslick. Bruckner was a drunkard, they said. Even Brahms got in on it, saying that Bruckner wrote symphonic boa constrictors, although sometimes that quote is attributed to Hanslick instead. High treason, revolution, and murder were among the many hyperbolic and metaphorical charges levied against Bruckner and his works by the Viennese critics. It's strange to consider that Bruckner would be so fascinated with writing symphonies, and with writing music pretty much free from extra musical programs, and yet would fall on the Wagnerian side. Wagner and Liszt, the founders of the so-called New German School, were fond of writing pieces that went beyond the traditional forms. They thought the sonata and the symphony and the opera were all dead. It's the reason that Wagner wrote music dramas, not operas. It's the reason that Liszt wrote symphonic poems and not symphonies. It's the reason that those two wrote pieces that largely had programs. They had extra musical connotations to them, and Bruckner didn't. Bruckner didn't just insist on writing symphonies, he doggedly persisted in writing them through poor receptions of his work. In 1866, he wrote his E minor Mass and his C minor First Symphony, followed two years later by his F minor Mass. The stress of having to present works like these in front of an anti-Wagner and thus anti-Bruckner audience, and his continually held lifelong belief that he was inferior to others led to a nervous breakdown, and he had to spend three months recuperating in a mental hospital. For the rest of his life, Bruckner had a pattern of teaching, playing the organ, and writing big symphonies and choral works. For years, it seemed hopeless that Bruckner would ever achieve notoriety. Stories abound, apocryphal or not, of his piety and his deference to others, despite the fact that many people who met and got to know him regarded him as far smarter than themselves. He complained in January 1875 that he had little more wealth than a beggar, and later that year the Vienna Philharmonic dropped a planned performance of his third symphony, the so-called Wagner Symphony, due to time constraints. The connection between Wagner and Bruckner was just too profound for the Viennese to let Bruckner off the hook, and it seemed as though Vienna was just going to be forever against him. And he was so poor, that he couldn't even afford a copyist to help him finish his fourth symphony. He was, however, adored by his students at the conservatory, and when a post came open at the University of Vienna in 1875, Bruckner got it. In doing so, he got revenge on Hanslick, who, in addition to being one of the foremost music critics in Vienna, was also the music dean at the university, and he tried his darndest to block Bruckner's appointment. He'd successfully done so in 1867, but couldn't in 1875. Bruckner's hiring appealed to those who ranked higher than Hanslick. It was actually Karl Ritter von Stremeyer, at that point Austria's education minister, who got Bruckner the job, and, as thanks, received the dedication of his Fifth Symphony. His accolades as a performer at the organ and his tours around Europe in that capacity helped to boost his spirits when the critics got too harsh. When the Vienna Philharmonic finally relented in 1877 and agreed to go forward with a performance of one of Bruckner's symphonies, it was largely due to pressure put on them by the conductor Johann Ritter von Herbeck, who died before rehearsals began. And no other conductor wanted to touch the Third Symphony with a ten-foot pole, and so conducting duties fell to Bruckner himself who was by no means a good conductor. He was just too deferential to what others wanted to do. And he had no way of really putting his foot down and forcing an orchestra to play things in the way he wanted them to play. Especially when that orchestra was the Vienna Philharmonic, which did not want to play this piece in the first place. Violinist Rudolf Zöllner recalled a moment where Bruckner meekly asked the ensemble to play a section again, and they just laughed at him and didn't do it. 
When he conducted them in December 1877, the performance was roundly booed, jeered, and mocked. By the end of it, there were only a handful of staunch Brucknerians left in the crowd, trying to cheer Bruckner up from what had been an objective disaster of an evening. Among these fans was the young Gustav Mahler, who helped create the piano duet reduction of the symphony, a good way to popularize works in those days, and as thanks, got the manuscript of the edition, the Philharmonic Plate. Throughout the rest of his conducting career, Mahler would continue to program and perform Bruckner's music. Things began turning around for Bruckner in the 1880s. As he was busy working on his sixth symphony, the conductor Hans Richter paid him a visit and discovered the fourth symphony, called the Romantic Symphony by Bruckner himself. Richter programmed it and invited Bruckner to a rehearsal, after which Bruckner was so smitten with the rehearsal that he tipped the conductor. I sometimes see this incident cited as evidence of Bruckner's provinciality or evidence of him not knowing social customs and mores, but he had to have known better by then, so I always have seen this story as Bruckner just being so thankful that someone would take interest in his music and rehearse it, let alone perform it, that he, poor as he was, wanted to express that gratitude by any means necessary. The premiere of this symphony in February 1881 was the first real success of Bruckner's career, although it wasn't, as usual, without its Brahmsian detractors, including in this instance Hans von Bülow, whose wife had left him for Wagner while he'd been conducting Wagner's operas, and so he was a bit miffed at the Wagner camp. This was around the same time when mutual friends of Bruckner and Brahms got the two men together for a dinner, which went about as awkwardly as you would expect. The two just didn't understand one another on a fundamental artistic and philosophical level, but one of their shared loves was great food and good beer, and so they were able to bond over that. Just once, they were able to over smoked ham and dumplings. Bruckner was always open and honest about how his music differed from that of Brahms. He didn't think poorly of Brahms, but he just said that he preferred his music and his style better. To understand a little bit more about Bruckner's symphonies, we have to understand how they fit into the larger scope of symphonic history. The musicologist Carl Dahlhaus proposed a circumpolar model of symphonic development. That is, there wasn't a direct line between the Mozarts and the Haydns of the world through the Bruckners and the Mahlers much later, but rather that once it got to Beethoven, all of the other composers since Beethoven, basically Beethoven through Mahler, were inspired by one or more Beethoven symphonies, using those as their point of departure and their model. According to this model, Schubert was inspired by Beethoven 1 and 2, Schumann by Beethoven 3, 5, 7, and 8, Berlioz by 6, and of course Mahler and Bruckner by Beethoven 9. Regardless of what one thinks of Bruckner, or Dahlhaus's theory really, his helpful way of understanding and categorizing the aesthetic models from which these composers were coming. While it's true that none of Bruckner's symphonies include a choral element, which for many is the defining feature of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, they do take after Beethoven Nine in many other ways that go beyond just this sort of surface-level aesthetic. The typical Bruckner symphony begins very quietly. It has a strong emphasis on counterpoint, embraces a wide harmonic palette, is of considerable length, and often, when using sonata form, deforms it in certain ways, often by including three themes rather than two. Sonata form is typically used to refer to Bruckner's first and final movements, but by the time you get to the sixth and seventh symphonies, the sonata analysis tends to fall apart. Those who make the case that these late first movements and finales are still in sonata form have to make the argument that it is a deformed sonata form. That is, instead of having the tension and resolution played out through the course of the movement, the resolution is all in the coda. It's backloaded so that there's a bunch of tension and then resolution at the very end. It's certainly not what one comes to expect from the exposition, development, and recapitulation of a classical era sonata form. For much more rigorous formal analysis, there is a dissertation by Nicholas Robert Steinwand that I've linked down in the description. We see occasional tweaks of this mold, and many, many words have been written about the exact nature of this mold, but the point was that there was a mold, in a way not seen in a symphonist since perhaps Franz Josef Haydn. The first two numbered symphonies, because there's also an early symphony number zero, which Bruckner later withdrew, 
see Bruckner finding his mold, but once he found it, he basically stuck with it from the Third Symphony onwards. You pretty much know what you're gonna get with a Bruckner symphony, which is great if you love it, but it's aggravating if you don't. If you like your symphony short and sweet, then Bruckner isn't for you, but if you're ready to go on a long musical journey, then Bruckner ranks alongside Mahler as the double whammy of long, late romanticism. Is it any wonder that Mahler was such a big fan of Bruckner? But unlike Mahler, who sustains your interest through these long pieces, through a kaleidoscopic orchestral fabric where everything in the kitchen sink is thrown at you in a constantly evolving orchestration, Bruckner is much more economical in his orchestral approach, and he chooses to reward the patient listener. Additional hallmarks of the Bruckner style include the so-called Bruckner rhythm, two quarter notes followed by a quarter note triplet, that is when he's not using quintuplets or heavily dotted rhythmic figures. And his finales, much like the finale of Beethoven 9, takes a long range view of form. In the Eighth Symphony, the climax features all the main themes of the previous movements coming together in counterpoint with one another, sounding at the same time. While in the Ninth Symphony, there's a moment where all seven notes of the harmonic minor scale are sounded as a chord. We also see evidence of Bruckner's background as an organist in his symphonies, such as in his use of pedal points to anchor long passages, or his quick alteration between two very distinct orchestrations, much as one would hear if one switches between two different manuals on an organ. Curiously, he never wrote any major organ works, preferring instead to use his organ prowess to generate ideas that would go into his symphonies. His orchestrations exhibit a general lack of percussion, which is curious vis-a-vis -vis the era, but again, you just go back to... He was an organist, and there are no unpitched percussion stops on an organ. We often see added contrapuntal layers when ideas are repeated, which is not uncommon for any composer, regardless of whether or not they're an organist, but perhaps this links into the tradition of using a descant, a contrapuntal line added on top of the final stanza of a hymn. Additionally, his music is riddled with pauses, breaths to those who like his music, and distracting pauses to his detractors. Perhaps this also links into that on an organ, sometimes you have to pause to reset the stops and continue to play. Bruckner was a man of deep religious faith, and he was so pious that he once knelt down and prayed in the middle of a counterpoint class because he'd heard a choir rehearsal happening next door. His Ninth Symphony was dedicated to God himself, but this wasn't Bruckner being full of himself, this was just him trying to be a good Catholic. But speaking of people being full of themselves, Richard Wagner. Wagner apparently once said, Bruckner, he is my man, when asked of him. But when they first met, which is around the time that Bruckner was writing his Third Symphony, Bruckner was so awestruck by being in the presence of his favorite composer that he could barely sit down, and once he did, could barely stammer out the question of if it would be okay for him to dedicate a symphony to Wagner. And Wagner said that would be totally fine, because Bruckner's music gave him much pleasure, after which they split an entire barrel of beer. And Bruckner, because he drank half a barrel of beer, couldn't remember what conversation they had the following day. Still, Bruckner's relationship to Wagner's music is complex. He took the brassy textures and chromatic harmonies of Wagner's music and thrust them back into a more traditional mold, because he was writing symphonies. Bruckner was the first symphonic composer to make use of Wagner tubas, basically just big French horns which were built specifically for Wagner's specifications. He used these in his Seventh Symphony, whose slow movement is dedicated to the memory of Wagner. But Bruckner, to Wagner, was just a self-effacing, obsequious fanboy. Even though Wagner genuinely enjoyed Bruckner's symphonies, and in fact favorably compared Bruckner to Beethoven, his personal hero, there are ways in which Wagner could have intervened and helped Bruckner's career when he was still struggling. He just chose not to. At the heart of Bruckner analysis lies paradox. Why is it that he came to write the music that he did, and how can we square that with what we know of his personal life? His brain chemistry seems to have been a little off, because he obsessively counted things. He counted the measures in his symphonies, which makes sense on its own. He didn't have modern software, and he wanted to make sure that he was writing long pieces, which were also proportional, and keeping track of measure numbers is a way to do that. Fair enough. Thing is, he also counted a bunch of other things. When he passed a building, he had to know how many windows there were and how many bricks there were. And it doesn't just stop at harmless OCD. Throughout his life, 
His only infatuation seemed to be at girls who were still in their late teens. He kept a diary listing them, and more often than not proposed to them, although he was still so shy that when they inevitably rejected his proposal, he was still okay with being on friendly terms with them. He never married, but he came close when he was 43, when his engagement to the 17-year-old Josephine Lang was cut off because her parents thought it was kind of creepy. He was in his 70s when he would have proposed to the Berlin chambermaid Ida Boots, but this was a non-starter because she refused to convert to Catholicism. But by far the strangest aspect of Bruckner's life was his obsession with death. He kept a picture of his mother on his desk at all times, which is okay. The problem is he never had a picture of his mother while she was still alive. So he had the picture taken when she was a corpse. Imagine taking your theory assignment into Bruckner's office, and on his desk is this grainy black and white early photograph of the guy's dead mother. And it didn't end there either. When Beethoven's body was being exhumed to be moved to another cemetery, Bruckner managed to talk his way into the proceedings, got his hands on Beethoven's skull, and cuddled, and caressed it, and kissed it. Somehow he also did the same thing to Schubert, but hey, once you kissed one skull, what's another skull between friends? This was in 1888, the year he would turn 64. It was with the premiere of his Seventh Symphony in 1884 that he finally achieved the notoriety he'd long sought. The premiere was in Leipzig, not Vienna, although it was such a rip-roaring success that the Vienna Philharmonic had to relent and play it. He'd finally conquered Vienna. Hans Lick gave it a poor review, as always, but at least he admitted his bias in doing so. The last decade of his life awarded him the honors long denied him and he was quite prolific. He completed his Eighth Symphony, several major choral orchestral works, and three movements of his Ninth Symphony. He was still hard at work on the finale when he died in October 1896 at the age of 72. It's likely due to the symptoms that we know of that he finally bit the dust from some kind of heart failure, although he also had diabetes, which in those days was also a death sentence. Over the course of his illness, he'd be given his last rites, on three different occasions. Because of the incomplete state of the Ninth Symphony, performances of the Ninth differ. Some conductors choose to just play the first three movements, ending with the last breath of the Adagio, which for many is a suitable finale in and of itself, or round it out with his Te Deum, which Bruckner said, hey, if I don't live to write the end of the finale, you can just play the Te Deum instead. Many pages are missing as are details of the instrumentation, but enough exists that there are many reconstructions of the finale by various musicologists, who have spent their careers dedicated to figuring out what Bruckner would have done had he lived to complete it. He felt as though the Ninth Symphony would be his final symphony, perhaps giving in to the superstition of the curse of the Ninth. His only prayer was that God would let him live long enough to complete it, which he didn't. But this, of course, being Bruckner, he left very specific instructions as to how his body was to be treated after he died, that it should be embalmed and then put into an extra-wide coffin to be buried under the St. Florian organ. Why you would need an extra-wide coffin when you're dead, I do not know. Bruckner was one of the most humble characters of music history. His small apartment was only ever furnished by three main luxuries. One was a longtime servant named Kathy, the second was an English brass bed, I believe it was a gift, and the third was a bust of himself. Kathy would keep the composer in line. When he tried to, when all else failed, childishly get his way by saying, but I am Bruckner, she would respond by saying, and I'm Kathy, and that would be the end of the discussion. As far as the bust was concerned, his friends would be amused because he would often have these short little conversations with the bust when he walked past it. He was known throughout Vienna for his inability to judge social situations. He would often come over or underdressed and metaphorically put his foot in his mouth by saying stuff that came out wrong. This humble attitude did not bode well for Bruckner's compositions. While his idol Wagner had an inflated idea of his own importance, this contributed to Wagner having a very keen idea of what he wanted to see, and he insisted that his vision be executed to the letter. Whereas for Bruckner, he always assumed that everyone else knew better than him, and so he was all too responsive to criticism. If a conductor or a friend made a suggestion and said, hey, I think you need to change this, that, or the other in one of his symphonies, in all likelihood, he would implement that change. For musicologists and conductors, this has had disastrous consequences. 
In addition to there being multiple versions of many different Bruckner symphonies, he was also so deferential to everyone else that he never wanted to say, hey, I prefer this version or I prefer that version. He never had a definitive version of any of these pieces that he wanted, so you have to go through the original editions and the manuscripts and all the other cuts and try to put together what you think Bruckner would have wanted, as opposed to all the suggestions that were implemented by other people on top of Bruckner's original vision. Was this truly born from a genuine inferiority complex where he believed that everyone else knew better, or perhaps was he just wanting to keep the peace with his few friends? For many years, he didn't have that many allies in Vienna. Maybe he felt like he had to implement their changes if he wanted them to continue to be on his side. Which would be, again, kind of an extension of an inferiority complex, because he felt like he had to do something for someone else in order for them to continue to be his friend. It's impossible to definitively pinpoint the psychology behind why Bruckner did this. But we do know that for many years he was okay with orchestras making cuts and changes or any sort of alterations to his music so long as they performed his music, which lends credence to the idea that he just wanted performances and he didn't really care if they were authentic because he was so desperate for many years just to get a rehearsal. All the while he sent his manuscripts directly to the court library so they would have a copy of his originals on file. So perhaps his originals were the ones he really wanted to do and he just didn't want to make waves. Regardless, all the different versions of Bruckner's pieces have contributed to the Bruckner problem. Let's just take the Eighth Symphony, completed in 1887. Three years later, and Bruckner had revised the score based on the advice of several different conductor friends. Two years after that, and the first published edition came out, which was different to both of the prior two. Then in 1939, an Austrian musicologist named Robert Haas published an edition that was a mashup between the first two editions, which is rarely played nowadays because of two reasons. One, there's no historical reason as to why he made the decisions that he did to mash up two different versions. And two, he was a literal freaking Nazi. So the International Bruckner Society fired him and replaced him with Leopold Novak. Novak's scores have been the standard until very recently, when the International Bruckner Society announced that they were coming out with a third revised edition of their Bruckner Gesamtausgabe, their complete edition. And if you thought the eighth was bad, the third symphony has six different versions, three of which are mostly played, and there's great debate as to which one of those three out of the six that exist are the authentic version. Fortunately, symphonies 5, 6, and 7 largely escaped this cycle of revision. The Nazis were strongly pro-Bruckner, as Hitler loved Bruckner's music and personally wanted to restore the St. Florian organ and turn the site into a kind of Bruckner shrine. There's an argument to be made that Hitler was much more of a Bruckner fan than he was a Wagner fan, and yet Bruckner has largely escaped the stigma of being associated with the Nazis. He never wrote music dramas that could encode political messages, unlike Wagner, and he never wrote actual anti-Semitic pamphlets. Again, unlike Wagner. It was clear that Bruckner's story had been appropriated by the Nazis to fuel their anti-Semitic propaganda campaigns, but you can't blame Bruckner for the false narratives that others pasted onto his absolute music. And it probably didn't help matters that both Bruckner and Hitler had spent formative years in the town of Linz. Even today, Bruckner's music is something of an acquired taste, but even if it's not to your liking, it's worth becoming familiar with his works if you aren't already. His symphonies require a completely different listening mindset than many people are used to bringing to late romantic pieces. The Linzy plums to express his thoughts go by slowly. Mountains, either they're forming or they're climbing, or a common comparison. When I want to say something significant, Bruckner said, it was necessary for me, first of all, to create a silence. In this vein, his philosophy is much more similar to the minimalists, or even John Cage, than many of his contemporaries. In his time, he was either dismissed for being a simpleton who crafted symphonies as monstrous as they were formless, or as a cutting-edge Wagnerian who brought Bayreuth to the concert hall.